welcome everybody to the, our, the October general meeting of the Diamond Valley Writers Guild. It's October 22nd, 2022, and it's 9.35 a.m. Um, I want to welcome everybody. It's nice to see your faces from wherever you are. And uh, you're all looking good. You seem to be well-dressed and have smiles <laughs> on your faces. So uh, we can't ask for a better start than that. I have a few announcements to make uh, before we, we begin our prose reading. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier to Brenda that next year, starting in January, we're beginning our meetings on the third Saturday of the month rather than the fourth Saturday. And that way we're able to coordinate with another writing group, with, uh, express some interest in attending and uh, maybe we'll attend some of theirs too. Okay, um, I have an announcement regarding Straight Jackets Magazine. Uh, Ellen Wolf uh, let me know last night by email that uh, she's had a severe asthma attack and the doctor, she was in the emergency room and the doctor is keeping her in the hospital for three days or so. And she's under doctor's orders to take it easy. And because of, uh, uh, because of that and being shorthanded and um, with the with the um, magazine it's going the next issue will be uh, I guess postponed or put off till the the following one I guess it's in the spring is that right Cheryl y yes and I'd like to comment everybody who submitted I want to say thank you um, and everything that was submitted will just be held over okay to go into the next issue so okay as soon as ellen's able we will work on it um and send it out with the uh spring okay and, <laughs> and are, are you seeking any other uh participants no 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 because we work great it's just this <laughs> uh this is going a little too deep, but Ellen, because of Ellen's being in the hospital and my property got flooded out uh, with um, this latest round of flash flooding. Um, and so I've been dealing with that plus the online classes. So <clears throat> the overwhelming part for both of us just kind of made us, you know, I even suggested putting it out in November, but she said everybody's too busy. So she didn't want to do that. So, okay. Well, we understand and we have compassion and uh, as writers, we're very emotional people and we, we, we feel your pain. So uh, we're willing to wait. Okay. And now, now we turn to uh, one of our main events and that is the election for officers for next year. And uh, I'll open it up with a, a call for nominations. And so if, if you were, um, want to participate and run, you can. You can nominate yourself. If someone nominates you, you can accept or you, you can uh, say, I don't accept. So here we go. Um, our first office that we're filling is vice president. Do I hear any nominations for vice president? Oh, uh, Lynn has nominated Michelle Bassett um, and Jessica Bruce seconds. Okay. Are there any other nominations for vice president? I will wait 30 seconds. Are, are Michelle you going to ask me if, do you if accept, I accept the nomination? Oh yeah, do you accept well, the nomination? Well, let me yeah, think about this Michelle. for a second. So let me think about this for a second. Um, okay, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Okay. Well, our thirty seconds is about up. Are and there being no other nominations, everybody who approves, uh, say aye. 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 Okay, aye. Michelle is aye. aye. Any anyone opposed? Mm. Okay, there's only one opposed. So, <laughs> Michelle is um, vice president for the next two years. Okay, board member at large. 
Are there any nominations for a board member at large? I nominate. I will. Lynette Tucker. Do I hear a second? Dennis. I'll second. Okay. Lynette. Uh, I accept the nomination. Okay. Well, let me wait just a few more seconds here. Are there any other nominations for a board member at large? Okay, hearing no other nominations, everybody in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, all opposed? Okay, Lynette is the board member at large for the next two years. Okay, and the third office and last one is secretary. Do I hear any nominations for secretary? I nominate Sophia Barber. Okay, Sophia, are you willing to accept the nomination? Okay, someone seconded, who was that? Yes. Lynn Spreen seconded and Sophia accepted the nomination. Okay, great. Okay, any other nominations for secretary? Hearing none? Everybody who approves, uh, say aye. 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 Any, anybody opposed? Hearing none? Sophia is now our secretary for the next two years. Yay. Congratulations, everybody. Sounds like a, a good working group. And Lynn, you're I think free. We're, <laughs> I think we're going to do OK. OK, now I'll turn it over to Jessica for the prose readings. One moment, I have to traverse the entire hall. <laughs> No, I tried once, didn't work out well. All righty, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the 2022 uh, annual JoLynn Beering Memorial Prose Reading. Um, we have a lot of exciting readers today, a lot of good material, I'm very excited. It's been a pleasure to take over this mantle after uh, JoLynn's passing. Um, so, without further ado, we'll get right into it. We're starting off this morning with Michelle Bassett, our Vice President. Yay. Wait, it's the long walk. Can everyone hear me okay? How do I sound? I sound all right? I'm kind of short, so I have to come down here. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, I'm gonna assume that they can. So, good, good. So um, I'm reading an excerpt from my fantasy epic trilogy from book one, and it is The Legacy of Quimobana. The name of the novel is Minstrel's Daughter. It is a completed trilogy, but um, it is not published yet. So this is an excerpt, an introduction of a character in chapter two. Outside the circle of brightly painted wagons, Ralph stood listening. The night music of crickets, marsh owls, and full-throated bullfrogs accompanied lilting strains of dulcimer and wooden flute. The sounds mingled in the darkness, embraced by the glowing warmth of a southern delta evening. Often, he sought the shadows away from the others, preferring to be alone. A habit formed since leaving his old life for this new one. Through a gap between the wagons, Ralph glimpsed a handful of men and women lounging beside the campfire, their attention never straying far from their full tankards and willing bed partners. For a year now, he had lived among them, this wandering band of musicians, dancers, and acrobats, in smoky taverns and at backwoods festivals, at feasts held in the great halls of noble houses, or at revels hosted by rich merchants wishing to impress important buyers. Anywhere audiences thirsted for entertainment, Ralph played his lute and sang his ballads for silver coin. Without so much as a question about his past, the minstrels had taken him in, his troubadour skills enough to win his place. Although he found the loose morality of these lusty vagabonds an ill fit for his temperament, 
they had proven a decent enough folk when it came to looking after their own. So he stayed. When work proved scarce and the communal coffers dwindled, Ralph would hunt, fish, barter, whatever needed to be done to help support the band. Good at recognizing opportunities, he soon began to speak his mind, offering advice on which roads to travel, where to do, where to go to find work. More often than not, following his lead had proved profitable. So as the wet southern winter warmed into an even wetter southern spring, they began to regard his opinions as undisputed truths, his suggestions as quiet commands, thrusting upon him the responsibilities of leadership in tacit sent consensus. Suppressing a yawn, he rubbed a hand over his face. The prickly, short-cropped beard still felt strange to his touch, as if belonging to someone else. Though having surpassed his 20th natal day, at times he felt like a boy masquerading as a man, playing a part. Could whiskers make that much difference? Transform him into the troubadour he had chosen to become? He hardly recognized his image in the mirror anymore. Hope no one else would. A commotion, a woman's soft exclamation of surprise, the scuffle of a boot as men rose to their feet, snatched Ralph back from his wandering thoughts. In the flickering light of the campfire, an old man hunched, leaning heavily upon his gnarled staff. Mud clung to the tattered hem of his simple brown robe. A bit of rope, curling and frayed at the ends, loosely cinched the garment around a meager waist. Dingy gray hair, hair partially concealed his beardless, deeply lined face. Even so, Ralph recognized those ancient features, nearly spoke the name that came unbidden, Symbriel. But remembering where he was and who he was, who they both were, kept him silent. Cimbriel hobbled forward, a sleeping child cradled in the crook of one arm. I am told that bands of traveling minstrels take in unwanted children. Is this true? The crackling voice matched the decrepit appearance. A convincing act had Ralph not known better. He stepped between the wagons into the circle of firelight. Why do you wish to be rid of the child? I am barely able to care for myself, let alone the needs of a girl child. Cimbriel's voice quavered with age, but his eyes held in ageless intensity. She's a pretty little thing, half I Devon. A murmur rippled through the assembled minstrels. Except for the purpose of trade and diplo dis diplomacy, the long-lived peoples of Shea had little to do with their Dianese neighbors. Romantic liaisons between humans and Nydevans were rare. Half-blood offspring, rarer still. Her name, the full intensity of Simbriel's gaze met Rolf's, is Raydriana. Ralph stiffened, mind grappling with the implication. He pushed his way through the knot of gathered minstrels to stare down at the sleeping little girl. Fair as morning with hair of silk and gold, in the slant of her cheek, the exotic shape of her closed eyes. Her father's Idevan lineage was achingly apparent. But by the shape of her nose, her mouth, softer human features, he recognized the blood of her mother, Loriana. The child's father and mother are dead. Dead. Splintering realization tore through Rolf. For a moment, he could not breathe. He wrenched his gaze away from the child, sought Cimbriel's. No denial shone in those ancient eyes. The minstrels pressed closer for a better look at the half-breed orphan. One of the women took Radriana in her arms. Another fetched a blanket. Cimbriel pulled Rolf aside, pitching his voice low so no one else would hear. I have placed an enchantment upon her. When she awakens, she will remember nothing of what happened only that she belongs here with you. Rolf's lungs constricted with me. She is in danger. Cimbriel made no pretense at persuasion. She will be safest here. I, I, I can't take care of. His words collided with his ambivalence, faltering before he could finish the thought. Gulping air, he surveyed the assembly of drunken musicians, hucksters, and loose women, the people who had taken him in and made him their leader without knowing, let alone caring who he really was. Finally, he whispered, she doesn't belong here. Neither do you. His words turned bitter. You know why I left, why I cannot go back. I want no part of my old life. Look at her, Cimbriel pointed a craggy finger at the bundled child. Look at her and tell me you want no part. Of their own volition, Rolf's eyes sought Radriana. How, how did my sister die? An assassin's blade. Ralph shut his eyes, fresh grief playing a discordant harmony to older, deeper grief. Cimbriel pitched his voice even lower. I am in time. I was in time to thwart Radriana's abduction, but not Loriana's or Norin's mur murders. I am not asking you to return, only to take in your sister's orphan. Something within, more powerful than the old man's words or a brother's duty, compelled Rolf to move toward the clump of women 
and gather Radriana in his arms. She stirred, opened her eyes like amethyst, two crystalline jewels in the moonlight. For a moment, she stared up at him, seeming more in wonder than fear at seeing a stranger's bearded face, and a contented smile crossed her lips, a child's pure, unquestioning trust. Amid the dark branches of the moss-hung trees, an eerie indigo-blue luminescence caught Ralph's eye and then faded. Cimbriel was gone. Ralph held Radriana close, truly afraid for the first time in his life. He knew nothing about raising a child, about being a father. Yet, as he gazed down at her sleepy face, her delicate features already becoming beloved, all fear cowered before a sudden, overwhelming surge of protectiveness. Cimbriel was right. No one would think to look for her, her here among a wandering band of minstrels and thieves, tellers of fortune and women of pleasure. No one would think to look for either of them here. Thank you. Absolutely getting my steps in this morning. All right. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal. Next up, we have El Presidente himself, Howard Feigenbaum. You're muted. Okay. There, I'm unmuted now. Okay, this is an excerpt from uh, the third book in the Benny Goldfarb Private Eye Trilogy. The book title is Hot Zone, and it actually refers to the Panama Canal, which is where most of the action takes place in the country of Panama. Um, Benny Goldfarb uh, has a, a client. It's the wife of the uh, Consul General from Panama in Los Angeles, and she comes to him and she says she wants him to find her husband's hidden assets and who he's having an affair with. And then he doesn't want to take the case, but the FBI comes after the woman leaves and tells him they want him to take the case because they're interested in the husband and his connection to this uh, Chinese military attache stationed in Panama City. And the FBI is concerned about the growing Chinese influence over the canal and what they might be doing to embed technology, uh, their own technology in the canal. And so Benny takes the case, his wife Rosa accompanies him. Uh, a day later, um, the wife uh, uh, of the gen consul general, uh, this, uh, he has her in a hotel room for her own protection because she's been battered. And he comes to the hotel room and she's disappeared. And Benny and Rosa go to Panama to find her. And they track her down to this small town called Agua Dulce in Panama near the coast. And this is where we start. On the road into town, I hailed a taxi. Where are you going, amigo? How about a tour around town? Of course. He eased the cab onto the road. Where are you from? My wife and I are from Los Angeles, California. I thought so. The wife. She is a movie star, no? It was easy to see why he asked. Rosa was an eyeful. Her voluptuous figure demanded attention, even while hidden beneath a plain white blouse and denim skirt. The sunglasses and sheer scarf added a touch of mystery that Sophia Loren would have appreciated. Rosa laughed. You see, Benny, you were with a movie star. She checked the driver information card attached to the seat in front of her. You are too kind, Ricardo. I am a Colombiana transplanted to Los Angeles. Are you two on vacation, he asked. Not many travelers come to Agua Dulce. We're looking for someone, I said. Who? I know most everyone in town. Maybe I can help. The daughter of a salt dealer, Rosa said. Ah, I see. Now I know where to take you. Las Salinas, the salt works. There are only two things to see here, salt and sugar. 
I will take you to the salt. About nine kilometers from the village, white pyramids of salt contained in rectangular shallow pools dotted the flat landscape. The water levels in the pools vary based on the stage of evaporation. Where the process was complete, white crystals sparkled in the hot afternoon sun. I would like to take some photos, Rosa said. She rolled down her window to survey the neat rows of salt crystal mounds. Ricardo parked the car. Who is this daughter of a salt dealer you are seeking? Rosa brought up the gallery file on her phone. A DHS passport photo obtained by the FBI appeared on the screen. She held the phone so Ricardo could see. Do you know her? The driver remained quiet, his face solemn. Rosa kept the image in front of him. You can tell us, we are here to help. Ricardo dropped his gaze before looking up. He spoke in a somber tone. She is Bonita Cortez. Everyone knows her. She is from Agua Dulce. But now she is the wife of Esteban Quintero, a diplomat, a very important man. Ricardo stared at the salt flats. Is something wrong, I asked. There is, there is bad history. What do you mean, Rosa asked. When Benita was 18, everyone thought she was the most beautiful girl in Panama, the pride of Cocle province. She and her novio, her sweetheart, a handsome young man, Julio Doran, were engaged to be married. One weekend, Esteban Quintero came to Agua Dulce with two friends to fish. They chartered a boat for the day. On weekends, Bonita worked on the boat to earn money for her study at the university. Ricardo halted his story to keep his composure. He inhaled a deep breath and continued. The men got drunk and raped her. Her father was crazy for revenge. He wanted to kill them all. He managed to kill two of them with his pistol. What about Quintero, Rosa asked. Why did he not die too? He was too rich to die. He made a deal with the father. Quintero agreed to marry Bonita and pay the family a lot of money. The father never again had to sell salt for a living. And Julio, I asked. He disappeared, as did the bodies of Quintero's friends. There was no justice. Ricardo spit out the words with contempt. He is not a good husband to her. We hear the rumors, cheating with other women and abusing her. He is hated around here. I waited a few minutes for Ricardo's emotions to cool. If you wanted to locate Bonita, where would you look? Ricardo faced me, his eyes narrowed. I would leave things alone. You will find nothing but trouble. Ricardo faced me, no. Uh, trouble has already found us. We work for Bonita. She left Los Angeles in a hurry to protect herself from Quintero. His bodyguard is after her. The driver stared at the white pyramids for half a minute while he slid his palm down his cheek. If you are determined, Porfirio Cortez, her father, lives on a rancho in the foothills, 20 kilometers from here. He is an old man now, but he still wears his pistol. Take care. And that's it. And um, I did want to add that um, I, I write on Substack and I have this book serialized on Substack. So I'm um, up to chapter four. So if you want to read it, you can go on Substack, howardfeigenbaum.substack.com and you can, you can read the book. I intend to post all of it. All right, thank you, Howard, so much. <laughs> All righty, next up, we have Erin Schalk. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin. Today, I'm reading an excerpt from my novel called Farewell, Mr. Garcia. This is a young adult novel. It's a coming-of-age story, and it's based on a series of three characters, and we follow them throughout the course of their life. And at this point in the story, each of these students, they are in eighth grade and they experienced a school shooting at their school. So we'll, we are meeting them again after they have been basically 
not able to enter into their school for a number of months because it has been a, a crime scene situation for all of this time. For the first time that I could remember, his chair sat completely empty. Mr. Garcia always brought his corduroy sport coat to class, and each day it was slung over the back of the chair by lunchtime. The coat was the color of gingerbread, complete with light tan patches on the elbows. He usually left the coat sitting there overnight, only taking it home every other weekend for an overdue wash. I paused for a moment, letting my hand rest on the, his chair's empty top rung. Had his clothes been confiscated? I brushed away the fine film of house dust that had settled on the seat. Hopefully he was sitting in his apartment right now, prepping tomorrow's lessons and enjoying some peace and quiet. I brushed his papers and planner clean, then stacked them into neat rows on his desktop. They had been scattered during the fingerprinting. For a moment, I cradled his stained ceramic coffee cup in my hand, then ran to the bathroom to rinse it out in the sink. I set the mug back on his desk where he could easily reach it. A quick glance at the wall clock. It was already 10 minutes after. <sighs> Great, mom's going to be livid. I flicked the light switch down, locked the classroom door and bolted outside with my backpack bouncing behind me. I began to take long strides toward her across the sidewalk when I noticed a flash of yellow in my peripheral vision. I lurched sideways and glimpsed a scrap of crime scene tape, probably no longer than eight inches, still tied to the branch of a young oak tree. The oak had barely begun to bud and stood against the flint sky in a skeletal silhouette. The yellow plastic rose and fell like a tattered ribbon in the wind. A chugging sound rumbled from below. Mom's engine had kicked into life. I tried to loosen the knot with my fingernails. The tape had shredded in places, leaving some sections caught in rough patches of bark. I pulled harder, feeling the tip of one of my nails splinter. The tape snapped free, sending me staggering backward into the grass. There. The school grounds almost looked back to normal again. Mom's tires crunched on the remaining gravel and salt that coated the hill slope. Through the windshield, I could see her eyebrows were knotted and her lips were pressed together in a thin, bloodless line. I crushed the scrap of tape into a tiny wad, keeping it concealed in my left hand. Mom pushed open the car door and waved her hand impatiently for me to get in. I tugged off my backpack and slid into the passenger seat. Neither of us spoke as she drove back down the hill toward the exit. Back in January, when everything happened, the parking lot had been a thick layer of gray slush crushed down into the concrete by countless sets of car tires. In that completely achromatic scene, the yellow tape had appeared as bright as neon. Adam had squinted out of the frosty car window, murmuring, Crime scene. Do not cross. The tape had stretched across the trees in zigzags that encased the school's front entrance into a suffocating web. I was never one to get carsick, but a queasy feeling welled up in the pit of my stomach, and I ducked my head down between my knees. I stared at the bits of salt and grit that were skidding along the rubber floor mat, and my insides churned with the motion of the car. A police car had screeched through the upper-level parking lot and stomped on the brakes, coming to a dead stop in front of St. Clair's doors. Blocked from driving any farther, Mom threw the car into park. For a split second, I imagined trembling Ms. O'Connor. Her frantic eyes were thrown open wide like a deer trying to evade a hunter, with dilated pupils surrounded by slivers of pale ash blue. Mom whipped her head around to face Adam and me. You too. No matter what he says or what's going on in there, you stay in the car. Her penetrating stare scanned for the slightest trace of dissent. Do you understand me? She finished, and her voice cracked like an ice sheet underfoot. We nodded. My stomach clenched, threatening to catapult my breakfast back up my throat. A young policeman who stood well over six feet tall exited the car. He had flicked off the sirens, but the lights were still flashing and flooded the nearby snowbanks with pulsating bursts of scarlet and electric blue light. 
He spoke in an undertone into the walkie-talkie he held at his mouth. With his free hand, he began waving Mom to exit the parking lot. Mom stepped out of the sedan, locking the doors behind her. Adam turned to me. What's going on? He whispered. I've never seen Mom like this. I'm sure it's nothing, I responded, patting the frayed black wool of Adam's gloved hand. But keep quiet. I cranked down my window, using my left hand to steady the tremor in my right. Excuse me, officer, but I work here. Mom pulled out her faculty ID card, holding it at his eye level. What on earth is going on this morning? She was using her authoritarian teaching voice. Despite her athletic strength, she stood just over five feet one inch, and her youthful features made her look about 25. She turned on this uncrackable demeanor to make sure people understood that she demanded to be taken seriously. Ma'am, I'm not allowed to discuss it, he responded wearily. You need to turn your car around right now and leave. You can't go inside the building today. There won't be any classes here anytime soon. From the back seat, I glimpsed mom's face in profile. Like always, she kept her facial muscles so taut that no traces of worry could seep from the corners of her eyes or the edges of her mouth. But for the first time in my life, I saw her olive complexion drain to ash. A shriek of sirens and more violent red lights pierced through the winter fog. Today, now that it was springtime, everything looked starkly different. April in the Midwest was not so much a full-fledged spring as a slow shift out of a snowy cocoon. From the car window, the newly planted soybean fields and fresh jack-in-the-pulpits whizzed by, framing my mother's face as she drove. The silence between us pressed into the knot at my chest. Mom, I began. I'm sorry I didn't meet you on time at the car. I dug my knuckles into my thighs, kneading the muscles with more pressure than I had intended. I'm not making excuses, I continued. It's just, I got distracted and I caught myself mid-sentence as a crimson trickle bloomed along the top of my pants. The fingernail I had cracked while I was trying to wrestle the scrap of tape from the tree had broken farther back than I had thought. I unclenched my left hand and squeezed the bleeding finger with my right palm. The tape scrap fluttered onto my lap. Mom slowed down to a stop at the light and flicked the turn signal down. A sharp exhale plunged through her nostrils. <sighs> you know, Nora, you've been distracted pretty much all the time lately. I really don't know what to do about it anymore. She turned to face me. Crime scene stretched across my lap in glaring block letters. Before I could tuck the ribbon away, her gaze locked on the tape and her eyelids crumpled closed. <sighs> Give me that. I hesitated. Mom, the light's about to turn green. Nora, give me that right now. Mom's voice reverberated through the car like a rattling snare drum. The left turning arrow flashed green. Impatient horns blared behind her. Nora, I've tried everything. I've tried talking to you. You won't talk. I've asked you to come out and exercise with me. You won't do it. I've tried to get you to spend more time with your friends, but you don't even call anyone. You just stay shut up inside. It was stuck. The, the, the tape was stuck in the tree in front of school. They forgot to cut it out when they did the cleanup. My voice was tight, like when trying to talk too soon after swallowing water the wrong way. I just didn't want anyone else to have to see it when we open tomorrow. Most of the cars began pulling around us. Their screeching horns interwove into a dissonant melody that echoed and faded as they passed. Mom rolled down the window and thrust her palm under my chin. I handed over the scrap and she tossed it into the remaining dirt and slush that hadn't yet melted in the shoulder. She pumped the accelerator and we pulled out into the next road before I could see if the wind had blown the tape away. Thank you. Wow, your descriptions are so vivid that her voice cracked like the, an ice sheet underfoot. Wow. Thanks.
Thank you, Daniel. All righty, thank you so much for that. Next is Daniel Kuttner. Thank you, change the order on me. Can, uh, give me a second, I'll put my headset on. Uh, no, we, we had a couple people drop out due to conflicts oh, or whatnot. So yes, out. you got moved up. All right, well, please bear with me here then. I was waiting to put this on. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Let's see. Yes, we yes. hear you just fine. You hear me? Okay, good. Um, let's see here. Fix something here. How about now? Still good? All right, let's see. All right, uh, this is a story, uh, a chapter from my novel Pipeline, which is published last March. And uh, it's about a, uh, a new auditor for a large oil company in Los Angeles. And while he's investigating something, they he's getting too close to some real uh, fraud perpetrated by a vice president of the company and his wife and so they ship him off to Alaska to the Alaska Alaska pipeline this takes place in 1975 when they were building the pipeline up there and while he's up there he stumbles on another problem which involves uh, child sex trafficking and he ends up getting kidnapped by them they're going to sell him off somewhere and uh, he ends up escaping and they're after him. So he's on a train in Texas uh, trying to get back to LA to blow the whistle on these people. <clears throat> so here he is on the train. Jake staked out the entrance to the private car. He considered several ways to make that banker leave little Rena alone. He discovered a banker that has a little girl in his stateroom there. Maybe he could even get evidence for the cops, but how many bigwigs were involved? How high were they connected? He caught a glimpse of the fat banker as he entered the private car. Jake rushed to catch up with him, but the door locked before he could grab it. He braced himself inside the drafty, wobbling no man's land and patted the jacket's pockets. He has, he's wearing the jacket of uh, one of the henchmen that he overpowered and uh, threw off the train. The cop's key ring jingled. He tried the keys one by one. The seventh turned easily in the lock. He crept inside and let the door click behind him. His eyes adjusted <clears throat> to the lower light level. Smooth, dark wooden paneling and perfumed velvet drapes absorbed much of the clatter. Crystal chandeliers clinked as the car swayed over the rails. He counted four roomettes at the front, two on each side. Moans and whimpers emanated through the brass fitted doors. He twisted the first handle, locked. He inched forward. A curtain at the end of the passageway revealed an open area ringed with velvet couches and easy chairs. Muted lighting shone on oil paintings, a plush carpet of burgundy and gold paisley. About 20 people hobnobbed, each paired with a child dressed in adult formal wear each outfit with strategic holes allowing access to tender areas. Instinct urged him to turn away, but Jake forced himself to scan the drunken throng. The adults' partners ranged from preteens to kindergartners at best. The obscene pawing of the kids revolted him. A few adults lined up dancing the hustle with their diminutive, dazed partners. The nearest couples soon stopped dancing and stared at Jake's railroad police jacket. He squinted as a light glared in his face. A thin man with slick hair laughingly raised his drink. Golly, the cops! Several around him joined in laughter. Forcing a smile, Jake walked further. He had located only one exit at each end of the car, the one he'd come through and another at the rear of the saloon area. That one led to a narrow outside balcony. Beyond that, the tracks clattered by. The DJ stopped the music and the partners froze, turning their eyes to Jake. 
A few of the children continued their drugged whimpering. One kept dancing alone. A white-haired, bearded man stepped forward. His image was that of a husky, ruddy-faced Santa, though his eyes flashed not with cheer, but interrupted lust. Good evening, officer. Join me at the bar, won't you? His grip on Jake's shoulder was more than an invitation. Not while on duty, thanks. Santa's grasp hardened. I insist you check out our stock, both liquor and, he nodded toward the dance floor, the other delicacies. In a lower voice, he added, you can also explain to me what you're doing here. He motioned to the stoop, slick-haired bartender. Two from my reserve, Lloyd. From among the champagne and exotic-looking bourbons and aperitifs, the barman chose a bottle of green liquid and filled two glasses. His hands shook as he offered them to Santa, who accepted the drinks and slid one in front of Jake. It's absinthe, European, a different kick, special label. The brand was written in Cyrillic characters. Jake pretended to sip some. The vapors alone caused his eyes to cloud. Santa swirled his drink. To what do we owe this interruption? We were told we'd be left, he arched an eyebrow, unmolested. Management wanted me to make sure you were happy with the service. It's top-notch as usual, in fact. Hold on, the rotund bunker, banker bellied up next to Santa. He held a leash hooked to a studded leather collar on a wobbly preteen boy. Upper management is right here. Remember me, nosy? He smacked Jake's nose with the tip of a riding crop. Four men surrounded them, suits bulging with bulked-up muscle and concealed weapons. The banker sneered. I recognize the hat and jacket. What'd you do with the real cop? He won't be joining you, ever. Party's over. The feds are going to meet us at the next stop. Fatso wrapped another loop of the leash around his left hand, pulling the boy closer. Bullshit. The FBI's here. One of those roomettes. There's a Texas Ranger over there on that couch. A senator over there. He pointed at a disheveled, white-haired man prone atop a small struggling figure. We're better protected than you are. He and Santa shared a belly laugh. Several tuxedoed men and a well-coiffed woman sauntered over with their captives. Several tuxedoed men and, oh, Fatso glowered. Enough playing around, boys. Would you invite Nosy here to leave? Out the back door, though. Maybe he can hit the ground running. The rattle of the train crossing jointed rail emphasized their speed. Two of the thugs each grabbed one of Jake's arms. Another opened the rear door of the train. Fatso continued, Have a nice stroll, if anything remains of your legs. He turned to the crowd. Any bets on how far he rolls? No? He figured, fingered Jake's lapel. Sorry, no takers. Do send us a postcard. The revelers parted, partied ahead of the men dragging Jake toward the open door. Wind billowed the curtains and rocked the tinkling chandeliers. Fatso and Santa raised and clinked their glasses of absinthe in a toast. Eyes closed, Jake clenched his teeth and pictured Jovius's lab. That's the lab where he was brainwashed and programmed. He whistled the three trigger notes. With a surge of strength, he gripped each thug's forearm, planted his feet in front of theirs and pulled. The startled hoods tipped toward one another, releasing Jake's arms, slamming their faces together, cracked teeth and facial bones. He hooked an elbow around one man's neck and pivoted further, launching him through the open door. Stumbling, the man's arms flailed. He grabbed the railing with one hand, flipped over it, and dangled, yelling. His grip slipped. Still shouting, he fell out of sight. Fumbling in the cop's jacket, Jake found a switchblade and flicked it open. The second thug, face bleeding, stumbled blindly. Jake grasped his wrist and pulled, jerking the man's body toward him. The momentum snapped the guard's head backward. Jake swung the blade upward, slicing into the underside of the man's jaw. He pushed the knife with both hands. The blade sliced through the man's tongue, pierced the roof of his mouth, and slid into his brain. Using the blade as a lever, Jake twisted flipping the thug over his shoulder out the back door and over the rail, 
disappearing into the turbulent darkness. The patrons cheered on the, cheered on the other two thugs. One took a position guarding Santa and Fatso. The other pulled a forty-five. From the side, Jake grabbed the hand holding the pistol and twisted. Stepping behind the man's knee threw him off balance. Jake hooked two fingers into the thug's nostrils and pulled. The man snorted and grabbed Jake, Jake's wrist, but he was too late. Jake forced the thug's pistol up to his temple and fired, mingling blood, bone, and brains with the wall decorations. The body thudded onto the carpet. A dark stain spread beneath it. The crowd backed away, silent. Jake wiped the soiled pistol on the body's jacket. The fourth thug pushed Santa and Fatso aside and fired, missing Jake, but striking a leather-clad woman who screamed and fell. Jake stepped forward and fired at Fatso, but hit the thug instead. He fired again, but the revolver only clicked. He threw the empty gun at Fatso's head and ran for the front exit. Behind the wounded henchman, Fatso shook his fist. You aren't out of this. Our people are waiting at the next station. The front door shut, the roar of the train separating Jake from the nightmare behind. Jake again whistled Jovius' three notes. Calm returned. He hurried back to Rena's compartment and wrapped the 323 code. Silence. The cop's passkey let Jake back into the roomette, but he did not see the little girl. His voice cracked. Rena. It's Jake. Where are you? Rustling emerged from the back, far back in the dark. Two dark eyes peeked from between the sleeper curtains. Mister, you did come back. Yes, it's me. Jake gave her some space. Her eyes locked on him. Rena slid from the bed and sidestepped to the couch. She sat and hugged the stuffed mouse. Are we safe now? Almost. I need to stop those people. There were too many for me to handle alone. What are you going to do? I've got one chance to get us out of here. The overhead speakers crackled. Ontario, next stop. Ontario, California is next. Jake picked up the cop's radio. He twisted the channel knob to emergency and pressed the mic button. Sunset Limited calling Ontario Security. That's it. There's a train. All righty. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have Karen Robertson. OK, well, um, this is a story I've always wanted to tell. It's a true story, but I could only tell it to a bunch of writers, I think it would get me blackballed if I ever sent it to a magazine. Uh, and also, I've discovered through a critique group this week that I have a favorite word, and I listened carefully to the first four readers, and nobody else uses it. So maybe you'll discover what, <laughs> what that favorite word is. The name of the piece is called My Lunch with an Editor. All I wanted as a freelance writer in 1980 was to sell a magazine article here and there. But when an editor invited me to lunch, I thought my writing career had broken through that glass ceiling. Yes, me, having lunch with a magazine editor. I could hardly breathe. I had submitted an article and she must have been awestruck by my talent and replied with an invitation to lunch. To say I was thrilled would be an understatement. What would I wear? My mother made all my clothes until I married, but I had just ordered my first professionally made garment. I called the tailor who was in the process of making my first suit. Sue, can you hurry? I have a lunch date with a magazine art, uh, editor. Can you believe it? Having a custom made suit was a first. Now I had an event special enough to wear it, high heels, hose, and lovely jewelry. When I put that suit on, I looked like the sharpest airline stewardess in the 80s, the finest fabric lined with Christian Dior silk. It was breathtaking, 
When I wore it, I felt like someone important, a CEO, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, or a future president of the United States. It fit my frame like a glove with a custom-made, beautiful, contrasting, printed silk blouse. On the day of my lunch date, I was met at the door of the publication by editor Dorothy. She was wearing a wrinkled, once white, shirt, which was stretched tight across her chest, where a button was missing, replaced by a safety pin, clearly visible. She wore faded jeans before wearing jeans was acceptable, ratty tennis shoes, and a hair arrangement that looked like it had been prepared with an egg beater before that too was fesh- fashionable. I didn't want to invite her to ride in my car because I was embarrassed by my little yellow Toyota Corolla that had been hit five times and had five different colors of yellow paint. So when she suggested we take her car, I accepted. I don't know what kind of car it was, but it had been a convertible with a torn top. She pointed, it's right over there. I left the windows open because my cat peed in the passenger seat last night. What? I'm going to sit in a seat that smells like male cat pee in my beautiful new custom-made suit? Please wake me up from this nightmare and don't let my new suit get stained. I'm hoping she'll take me to the golf course resort or one of those nice casinos. A block away from the magazine office, she parallel parked in front of the local hole-in-the-wall Mexican cafe. I can't get out of the car fast enough. We introduced ourselves again and slipped into a booth. The waitress brought a menu, and I struggled with my choice. She invited me, so I shouldn't order anything too expensive. A chicken taco a la mode seemed reasonable. My mother always said, when you are someone else's guest, eat lightly or order what they order. Surely Dorothy would order something similar for lunch. I gave the waitress my order and was ready for Miss Editor to order and get busy summarizing my article submission and my glowing talent. She gave the menu back to the waitress and breathed a sigh. Just give me a beer. Make it a tall one. For the rest of the lunch, she told me all her problems and those of the publishing company. I was glad I only ordered a chicken taco because in the time it took me to eat that small morsel, she guzzled the whole beer, shed a few tears, and was eager to get back to work. I was eager to get the heck out of Dodge. When the bill was placed on the table, Dorothy didn't make a move. I paid. I was glad I had eaten lightly because her beer cost far more than my taco. I thought about walking back to my car just a few blocks away, but didn't want to be rude and thought she needed a designated passenger. The moral of the story is editors do not live in ivory towers. I'd like to say they put their pants on one leg at a time. But on that day, I felt like that editor was a sorry example of anyone in authority. I hoped her ability to judge my writing was better than her choice of clothing, food, or behavior to this lowly writer. I don't think they ever printed my article, and I don't care. I had my suit cleaned, and I chalked the experience up to learning a good lesson. Editors are just people. I wonder if anybody picked out my favorite word. That was a very nice story, Karen. Beer, very, beer. very good. What was it, Karen? <laughs> and. Oh. And. All right. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Karen. I said 18 times I counted after it was all said and done. All right. Next is Tim Ritter.
Hey, every, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the first chapter of my first novel. I've done some nonfiction books, but this is the first. It's a historical family novel based on things that actually occurred. Uh, this is the first chapter of Choices uh, titled Utah is for Meeting. Monday, December 21st, 1903, Morgan, Utah. Strolling down the main street of Morgan, county seat of Morgan County, Utah, Allie stopped at stores seeking Christmas gifts for younger siblings back in Milton, just four mil miles distant on the bend of the Weaver River. Although small, Morgan dwarfed her hometown, yet her dreams took her far from both. Music and literature, especially poetry, possessed her heart, and she yearned to teach both. Her father, John, prospered in his farming, and seeing how the world was changing, he realized the benefit of education, told his children he would pay their way to college if they wanted. As the oldest, Allie jumped on the chance, becoming the first Thurston to attend any college. For four years, the University of Utah in Salt Lake City had opened her eyes to a broader world, and she found she wanted more. To get outside the narrow valley, to teach, and the music lesson she currently taught couldn't fully scratch that itch. After graduating, knowing she would likely leave the valley she grew up in, she took a year with her family, teaching piano. Soon after this cherished holiday time with her family, she would seek a teaching post somewhere, somewhere else. Stepping out from Cool Beer's Millenary with a package for her mother, breathing in the chilly late morning air, she heard it. The notes of a trumpet, Dixie, but sad and slow, somewhat plaintive. She had not hear, heard that arrangement before, but the pace picked up and the mood changed, hopeful and fun. Hmm, he's pretty good on that horn. Francis's mercantile caught her attention, led to another purchase, a pocket knife for Brother Jack, who had followed her at the university. Once more outside, the trumpet music greeted her. Okay, that's the last gift. Let me find this musician. Following the notes of the city park, she saw a small crowd, maybe 25 people, surrounding a young man with trumpet in hand who greeted the audience. Merry Christmas, you all. How are you doing with this chilly weather? A bit of a gu or flu? Maybe a sore throat? A cough from the cold? Or just tired from getting your crops in and preparing for winter? Have I got the solution for you for merely the cost of $1? distilled from a proprietary blend learned from local Indians who know how to handle this weather and snow. Now, of course, in this land of the Latter-day Saints, you won't find any alcohol in it, just ingredients the good Lord himself created. Uh, sir, over to the right, don't I recognize you from Ogden a few days ago? As I recall, you purchased a bottle for young child, Thomas. Uh, how is the young boy? Why, why, well, he's doing better, the man nervously responded. Allie recognized him as a young single man from Ogden with relatives in Peterson next door to Milton. She smiled, perhaps more of a smirk. She had seen these peddlers in Logan and Salt Lake City. They often brought along a shill or hired one for a few days. She leaned against the lamppost as the spiel went on. Nice looking guy. Kind of looks like Lord Byron the poet. He does have a way with the audience. So, Who's the first to buy a cure for what ails you? Addressed the young father, he said, sir, I'll only be here for a few days. Would you be interested in purchasing several bottles to keep on hand for young Thomas? Please keep in mind, I only have 24 bottles remaining. Uh, better give me two. Thomas does struggle in the cold weather. That primed the pump, and the remaining bottles soon disappeared, after which he said he'd make some more by tomorrow, so meet him at the band sign around 11. Allie remained at the lamppost with that faint smile. He'd noticed her, but who wouldn't? Slender, but womanly. Early 20s, dark hair with a striking face. Uniquely angular, but attractive. He sauntered over. Percy Bunyan Rice at your service, came with a smile. You have no interest in purchasing a bottle? Oh, no, not at all. But I did enjoy the show you put on. Nice trumpet work, and you seem to do a new arrangement on the fly. Impressive. And speaking as a fellow musician, 
You've read the crowd nicely. Whatever are you implying, he continued is with a smile, implying that at all. I see through your scam. You make this stuff up on demand with cheap alcohol you lightly brought in. I imagine you have a wagon. Is the one by the cottonwood tree yours? I don't recognize it. The one with the tarp covering the load? Uh, if you promise not to reveal my secret, then I will confess you found me out. I've discovered the, the local yokels in small towns tend to be the most gullible. The work is easy. I get paid to play my trumpet, make a good living, get to see the country, and to meet fine people, but none so attractive as you. You never quit with the lines, do you, as she smiled. Uh, but every word is true. Well, what I said to you, not to the crowd. So why are you admitting this? I could ruin you in this town. A good question, uh, but one with an answer. I don't know myself, but I see something in your eyes. A desire to, to break out, to not fit in. I've been in a lot of towns, met a lot of people. But something about you seems to fit with me. You sense it too? Uh, you move too quickly, young man. But do you seem to move with me? Perhaps, just perhaps. Tell me, are you LDS living in Utah? She laughed. My grandfather pioneered this valley. He built the road to Ogden that you came in on or will leave on. He was the bishop. Another grandfather was one of the main scouts of the first trip here with a note of sadness. So you are too? <laughs> Whoever said that? None of his children joined the church, and that includes my dad. Kind of lonely being one of the few non-Mormons around here. Well, perhaps I could help us watch that loneliness. I tried a cafe just down the street, Stewart's. Uh, may I enjoy your company at lunch? But only if you could provide your name. Stewart's, not a bad choice. Yes, you may, you may enjoy the company of Miss Allie Thurston. Although she ate, Allie never tasted the food, captivated by the touch of adventure he brought. She knew she could lose herself in those blue eyes and soothing voice. So she fought it. So young stranger, tell me about yourself. How did you wind up in a small town like Morgan? Where do you call home? Percy recognized the signs. They weren't unknown to him. A young country girl impressed by a traveler from outside, trying to find reasons to resist the attraction. He began to reel her in. I call Lexington, Kentucky home, but my father has a horse ranch there and until recently was the mayor. Allie also recognized the attempt to impress a country girl and moved her queen. You know, I believe one of my grandfathers, Colonel Jesse Little, may have traveled through Kentucky several decades back to meet President Polk. Percy's eyes raised a little at this worthy adversary. She continued, that was to authorize the Mormon battalion. They helped win the Mexican War. A soft yet sardonic smile, sardonic. Why are you far, so far from such a nice home? He paused. I love music. I love traveling. I love meeting new people. Up to now, I've not found a reason to settle down. She paused. Then with a subtle smile, has that changed? Maybe, maybe it has. A long silence arose with a sense of comfort in each other's presence. He first broke it. So where are we? What comes next? She replied, I suppose that depends on you. What do you desire? Another small town local for one quick night or something more permanent. I think I might be willing to give up the road. And his response amazed him. This Miss Allie Thurston had qualities he'd never encountered. Intelligent, witty, a unique beauty that pulled him in. Musical, insightful, frank. The latter both intrigued and concerned him. Well, when you decide, I'll be in Milton. Go west on the Morgan Road, about four miles. Just ask for John Thurston's home. Sandstone, one story. J 
just off the main road on the right. Everybody knows him. Everybody. And with that, she picked up her packages, strode outside, found her buggy, and headed back to Milton. Funny how that last everybody held a note of warning. In real life, that was on Monday. They next met on Friday, the day after Christmas, and married that day in the courthouse. And then the rest comes in the rest of the book. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We lost our camera. Stand by. There it goes. All righty. Next up, we have Greg Porterfield. Well, um, mine's not going to be that long. This was uh, this piece was uh, originally from a, a book that I self-published on Amazon now uh, a number of years ago. Um, the name of the books, uh, in case you haven't already picked it up, is uh, "Don't Fear the Rewrite." Um, this is something most of us fear greatly is rewriting and rewriting our pieces and half the time we get it right half the time we don't the name of this one's called one-eyed man life is more than living and living more than existence existence more than survival and survival more than a mere fragment of life johnson was always there on the on the corner had been as long as I remember. His guide dog, Shep, died three winters ago, and I can't for the life of me figure out how Johnson found his way around. I mean, the guy was blind, had been since birth. Other than that, he seemed to be in pretty good health, never even had a cold as far as I know. Some people called him a beggar, but he never asked me for money. He said he just liked that particular corner something about the late afternoon sun the breeze coming off the lake was cool in the summer and the granite of the wall held the warmth of the winter sun sheltering him against any cold wind he talked to me of strange things he read short passages from a braille bhagavad gita and talked about life in a small village in tibet he spoke of passing seasons along a stream beneath a tree with his dog. Sometimes I could almost see Johnson sitting there with Shep at his side. Johnson always had a small bag of seeds and raisins and told me it was brain food. One day he showed me a gold coin. He said it was a, a doubloon. I didn't doubt him even when he told me that it had been part of Blackbeard's treasure. Last week, as the sun set, he gave me a fierce bear hug and thanked me for being his friend. The next afternoon, he was gone. In his place on the corner was a small, leather-bound book of the Bhagavad Gita in Braille. On top of the book sat a gold, gold coin covered by a bag of seeds and raisins. Johnson never came back. I've been trying to learn Braille and I enjoy the warmth of the sun here on the corner. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you for sharing, Greg. All righty, next up we have Sophia Barber. Hello. Should I be this close or can I be a little further back? Because I have to lean down to the mic. All right, so unlike uh, most of the other people who are reading today, this uh, is not an excerpt from any book I've written. 
Um, this is actually an expanded um, assignment that I had to do for a creative writing class a couple of years ago. And the characters I'm familiar with, because I've been playing around with them for quite a few years, but it does not go with a book. So it's not an overarching story. I know all of it, but it hasn't been written down at all. Um, and it does not have a title. It is simply a little experience. Lyra gazed out of the window of her apartment as she perched on her window seat. As usual, the city was alive and buzzing with noise and light, even though it was well past midnight now. All around her apartment complex were office buildings, multi-storied malls, and mega skyscrapers that just a century previous would have been regarded as architecturally impossible. They reached up like fingers, grasping towards the black night sky. The building's lights shone like the stars that they had stolen from the blank expanse above, and now they were after one last conquest, the moon. It was the only celestial body nowadays that could stand its ground against the light-polluted sky. The city was uncaringly beautiful with its neon signs advertising all manner of new products, from the latest computer to a silicone-free hair care product. Cars sped through the raised streets like blood pumping through veins. Far, far below the raised highways, Lyra knew there were pedestrian walkways closed in by smaller shops, interspersed with dark alleyways. From her apartment's height, however, it was impossible to guess that anything other than more highways could be found under the vein, Lo Priera's largest speedway. The only reason she knew was because she had to walk those crowded streets to stores that were inaccessible by car. Not to mention the owners hated the attention around their storefronts. Lyra pressed her hand to the glass window and pushed, forcing it to swing outwards onto her personal flower balcony. She hopped out onto the concrete floor fenced in by spiraling black iron. It was an antique design, one Lyra often saw in pictures of old France, but it was simplistic and sinister in just the way she liked so she made an exception for its old age. Hidden in the steel designs were constellations and planets, so beautifully carved that it almost looked like they were really orbiting. Perched on top of the fence were violets, lavender, foxgloves, and hydrangeas, each group of flowers in its own special planter, labeled with handwritten signs. Not that she needed it to recognize the flowers, but it felt more put together this way. Crawling across the inner bottom edge of the balcony above her own, Bright wisteria flowers swayed in the night wind. Though she wasn't much of a plant person, her sister Despina was. In fact, Despina was the one who gave Lyra the flowers as a moving away gift. Though she complained about how much work they are and how much water they take up, Lyra was secretly extremely grateful that her sister had given her the flowers. Their need for water every day never failed to make Lyra remember her own basic needs, though which she was sure was, the re was one of the main reasons Despina gave her the damn things in the first place. Exhaling on a sigh, Lyra stared out over the obnoxious metropolis she had called home for the past three years. The wafting scent of the flowers reminded her of her sister and the much larger garden back at their childhood home. Despina still lived there, regally carrying on the memory of their family legacy, as she put it. Lyra's older sister could never seem to let go of that past, while she herself couldn't stop running away from it. The dusty, dark hallways, the pregnant silences in every nook and cranny, the expectations still lorded over the children's heads, even after the owners of such projections had died. Lyra had moved out as soon as she had the means. And though she loved her sister very much, Lyra knew she would never be able to understand her on this matter. Why was the past so important to her? Hell, that's even what these flowers are all about. They facilitate the memory of Lyra's family, even in her new home. A constant reminder of both sweet and sour notes. Groaning, Lyra reached into her jacket pocket and pulled out an electronic device about the dimensions of a casino chip. The chip nimbly weaved in between her fingers as Lyra's thoughts traveled from the past to an extremely pressing future. Lyra may have escaped the old family home, but was unable to escape the old family business. Stealing, modifying, destroying, Lyra dealt in the business of information. Her favorite of the skills passed on to her and her siblings. Lyra thought it was easiest in this city to stick to what she had always excelled in. The more bloody or hands-on arts never spoke to her quite like they did to her brothers, and she wasn't as confident a manipulator as Despina, if the flowers were anything to go on. So spying and investigating were the only tools she had at her disposal when she decided to start her own little business here. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on whose side you're on, 
Lyra was just a little too good at her job to stay under the radar of more complicated clients. Like the owner of this chip, for example. What a request, what a reward. All wrapped up in this tiny disc of circuits and metal. She should have known better. Thank you very much. That was very good. All right. Last but certainly not least, well, perhaps in my eyes, Liam Bruce. Hi. Can everybody uh, hear me okay? Or can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Cool. Because I had no idea if you'd be able to or not. So hello. So this is a uh, this is a short story I wrote specifically. Well, actually, I wrote it several years ago, and I rewrote it for this purpose, um, for this event. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. This is Terminal. Earth hung in the cold void of space. From my vantage point, standing before the vacuum grade windows of the lunar transit station, I soaked in the unobstructed view. The last time I get to see that old blue marble for a long while, maybe forever. The gray line of twilight edged westward across the globe, engulfing the east coast of the United States. By now, the sun would be setting over Manhattan, New York City, Sarah's hometown. A voice, synthesized to sound pleasantly female, came over the terminal's PA system. Attention all travelers, now boarding flight 1337 to Mars Orbital Station at gate 16B. Not my gate, not my destination. The ship I was boarding today would take me a hell of a lot further than Mars. I found an empty seat facing away from the window, slipped my phone out of my pocket and settled in to wait. A notification on my screen indicated no service, so I tapped the icon to see what the station's connectivity convenience fee was all about. 45 dollyen? No way was I paying that much for an hour and a half layover. Besides, there wasn't anyone I wanted to call and no one I cared to hear from. So instead, I slipped in an earbud, navigated to the only voicemail file I had saved locally, and tapped play. Hey there, Superman. I could almost see that playful smile, the one that always accompanied that nickname. I know you're probably busy saving the world, but we're still behind at the lab, so I've got to work late again tonight. I know, I know. Again, thought we'd try that new noodle place, my treat. I made a reservation for 8.30. I'll meet you there, all right? Gotta go. Be safe at work. Love you. After an hour of waiting at that restaurant, unable to get a hold of her, I drove to the lab. I found police barricades, rubble, fires. New York police handled the initial investigation and concluded that the explosion was a random accidental gas leak. My gut told me it wasn't that simple. It couldn't be that simple. But NYPD didn't appreciate some FBI counterterrorism agents sniffing around their open and shut case, particularly an emotionally compromised one. I never did get to try that damn noodle place. That was six months ago, six months and two days, but who was counting? No closure, nothing to bury. She was just gone. Friends paid their respects to an empty coffin. They invaded my home, our home, with casseroles and store-bought sympathy cards full of platitudes. All I wanted was to be left alone. I suppose it was funny in a grim sort of way that not one, not two, but four different friends of ours gave me coffee cakes because nothing says, I'm sorry your wife died like a fucking coffee cake. It had been Sarah's favorite dessert, but I couldn't stand the stuff. A little girl scrambled up onto the row of chairs across from me. She threw a leg over the backs and climbed the obstacle like a three and a half foot tall Marine. The plastic creaked against metal frames as she shifted her weight over the top and down the other side. She landed fast with an unbalanced wobble at the edge of the seat before falling butt first into the chair, giggling the whole way. Not missing a beat, she slid off the chair and onto her feet right in front of me. She stared with wide, curious eyes. Are you waiting for a ship too? I tried to offer a friendly smile. Yeah, I think just about everyone here is. Are you a soldier? Weird question. 
not anymore. But you were, right? Because you look like my daddy, and he's a soldier too. I looked around the terminal. And where exactly are your parents? Mommy's over there. She waved a hand over her shoulder without looking. And daddy went to a place called Europa. That's where we're going, to go live with him. You mean Europa? Yeah, that's what I said, Europa. Sarah had wanted kids. Me, not so much. I'd put her off, told her that we had time, that we didn't need to rush, and time ran out. Where did you say your mom was? Little girl plopped down on the seat next to me. Are you going to Europa too? Europa, and no, I'm going to Titan. Titan? Close enough. Why are you going there? I looked down and adjusted the ring on my finger. Because I don't want to be here anymore. She nodded knowingly. My mom says people shouldn't run away from their problems. Was I seriously getting psychoanalyzed by a six-year-old? What makes you think I'm running away from anything? You look sad like my dad did before he left. And was he running away from something? Yeah, but not anymore. My mommy's a mind doctor, and she said that daddy needed to trust his gut. I don't know what part of the head the gut is, but she knows, and she's really smart. I was running away from my problems, but no amount of facing them was going to bring Sarah back. Leaving, on the other hand, might make it hurt a little less. Yeah, you know what? Maybe you should go find your mom. She's probably worried about you by now. Dana, a short woman with hair that matched the little girl's, pushed through the flow of people in the main walkway. There you are. I told you not to run off. Come here. She took Dana's hand. I'm sorry if she was bothering you. She wasn't. She's just giving me some advice. Attention, all travelers, the synthesized voice interrupted. Now boarding flight 627 to Titan Colonial Station at gate 16A. Well, I grabbed my bags and stood. That's my flight. I hope you two have a safe trip. Bye, Dana waved. Have fun on Titan. I left the pair and walked over to the rest of the passengers, already queuing down the ramp at gate A. Once on board, I made my way to my cabin. Built into the far wall was a twin-sized Murphy bed. Next to it was a desk with space for one and a small couch, which faced a vid screen built into the wall opposite the bed. A male synthesized voice spoke over the cabin's intercom system. Greetings, sir. Welcome aboard Soul Trans Flight 627, bound for Titan Colonial Station. Please make yourself comfortable and at home. We will be departing shortly. Estimated travel time is three months, four days, and 11 hours. Thank you for choosing Soul Trans, where luxury meets the stars. Luxury meets the stars. Right. I turned on the vid screen, pulled down the Murphy bed, and flopped onto the surprisingly not uncomfortable mattress then pulled my phone out of my pocket and connected to the shipboard link. An hour and a half without service was one thing, but three months was quite another. I flicked the phone's control panel down, tapped the no service notification, and paid the 300 dollars yen service charge for the duration of the flight. Then I leaned back and watched a camera feed of the ship's exterior on the wall-mounted vid screen as I waited for my phone to connect to the ship's net link. From the camera's angle, Earth was hidden from view. Three whole months in space, the rest of my life on a new planet. The best part? No coffee cake pushing friends. The cabin lurched slightly as the docking clamps disconnected, allowing the ship to drift freely. A moment later, inertia pushed me lightly into the mattress as the ship's thrusters fired and put distance between us and the station, between me and my old world. This was a new beginning, a way to put my old life behind me my pain behind me. Find a way to move on. I looked back at my phone. A missed call caught my eye. Sarah, one new voicemail. That's it. All right. Thank you, Liam. That was very nicely done. So that concludes the 2022 uh, Joe Lynn Buring Memorial Prose Reading. Thank you to everyone who submitted, to everyone who read, and I hope next year, same time, I'll get more submissions and we'll have more lovely faces and more readings. 
Um, so thank you very much for everyone for participating. And Howard, it's back over to you. Yes, well, thank you, Jessica. It, you did a great job on, on your first prose reading event. And I enjoyed every single reader's selection. It was nice to see so much variety of, and uh, what your interests are in, in writing and and uh, what a good job you do. And it's, it's a pleasure to belong to uh, an organization like this where people do have their interests as writing and, and want to provide some kind of entertainment through their writing or some kind of serious thought. So uh, you've all done a marvelous job. And uh, that's it until January. So I want to wish all of you a very happy holiday season and stay safe and we'll see you next year. Okay, over and out. I'm going to leave the Zoom up for a little bit in case anyone wants to chat. And boy, I hope everyone has a wonderful...